Good morning, everyone. We are live and we will be starting our service in about six minutes. Please enjoy the pre service music. As you log on, please uh, just sign in and greet one another. You should be able to see who else is, is joining and greet one another and we'll have an opportunity to worship together here in about five minutes. Enjoy the pre-service music.
Good morning, everyone. I'm hearing a virtual good morning right now. So thank you for joining us this morning in our online worship service. I uh, just want to say two quick thank yous this morning. Thank you to Ron Wagner, who is running our camera this morning, and we'll uh, be panning back and forth uh, when we sing our, our hymns this morning. And also thank you to, to Sheila for accompanying our, our hymns this morning. Today is the fourth Sunday in Lent, and our theme for today is The Spirit Sets Us Free. Freedom is a, a thing that's a precious commodity to us, and it's something I hope we're treasuring a little bit more right now, as many of us are confined to our homes, we can't go to work, we can't go to school, uh, movie theaters are closed, all these things are going on right now. Uh, so freedom is a, is a real important thing. But God gives us freedom. It doesn't matter whether we're gathered together in a house of worship or whether we're worshiping with each other. Uh, in our homes, God sets us free through the power of the Holy Spirit and what Jesus has done for us. That will be the theme for our service today. You're invited to follow along with us. I did send out the order of service, both an uh, email as well as on a Facebook post, and uh, pray that you were able to get that and invite you to join uh, with us. Uh, we will be attending attempting music this morning, so uh, we're going to begin with our first hymn, and Ron's going to hand over to that, and we will uh, sing the first five stanzas of Dear Christians, One and All, Rejoice. Thank you. 
of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve Him as His dear children, but we have disobeyed Him and deserve only His wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to Him and plead for His mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. And let us pray. Almighty God, we confess that we deserve to be punished for our evil deeds, but we ask you graciously to cleanse us from all sin and to comfort us with your salvation. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson for today is taken from the Old Testament book of Genesis in chapter 37. Here we see Joseph in his youth, his father Jacob not being a very good father, and his brothers not being very good brothers. It is a reminder to us of what happens when we forget about this freedom that we have to serve. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, Listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheep rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. <clears throat> when he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you have? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. This is the word of the Lord. Our second lesson for today is taken from the New Testament letter to the Romans in chapter 8. This portion of God's Word will also be serving as the sermon text for today. God reminds us of the freedom that the Spirit has given. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. <clears throat> and so he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. 
But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Our verse for today is that familiar word of John 3.16. But God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, and whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Our gospel for today is taken from Matthew's Gospel in chapter 20. Jesus reminds us what true greatness is in the kingdom of God, the freedom to serve one another. <clears throat> now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. On the way, he took the twelve aside and said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and, kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want? he asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to give his life as a ransom for men. This is the Gospel of the Lord. I invite you to join now in singing our next hymn, Jesus, Your Blood and Righteousness.
God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the honor, glory, and praise. Amen. A portion of God's word for our study today is our second lesson. It's taken from the New Testament letter to Romans chapter 8, and I want to read just those first two verses again. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. This is the word of our God. We pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In the name of Jesus Christ, the one who has secured our freedom, and the Holy Spirit who has given you that freedom, your fellow proclaimers of our Savior. From our worship format today, I think it's safe to say that freedom means a little bit more today than it did even just a few weeks ago. We are not free to worship together in person with you sitting here in the sanctuary with me. We're worshiping virtually. We're worshiping online. That's because a virus has taken us captive. We're not free to go to school. Many of you are not free to go to work, but either are working from home, or you may just not be working right we cannot gather together in groups of ten or more. And even if we do gather, we have to keep social distancing in mind. At least, at least six feet apart. You might say we've had to give up some of our freedoms right now. So I pray that when this all ends and the virus is contained and we get the all clear that we can gather together again and go back to our day-to-day -day lives, that we're all going to appreciate a whole lot more of these freedoms that we enjoy. But even though we're worshiping virtually today, as believers, God reminds us of our freedom, and he tells us what it, tells us what it truly means to be free. You see, we know what real burdens are. And it's not just those burdens of having to deal with the virus and whether or not we're going to find enough supplies to make it through these, these weeks. The real burden that we face is the burden of the guilt of sin. God's word is real about that. But his, his word is also real about the freedom that he gives to us. And this portion of God's word that we're studying today is one of the most powerful descriptions in all of Scripture of this freedom that God has given to us. God's words are facts. They are truth in every way, shape, and form. God gives them to us. He's planted them in our hearts so that we believe those promises. That came about as a result of the power of the Holy Spirit working through God's unchanging word. All this is ours, courtesy of the Holy Spirit, because the Spirit sets us free. And do you notice how God said those words in our lesson for today? The Spirit has set us free. By those very words, it means that something was holding on to us. Something was holding us captive. So from what is the Holy Spirit setting us free? Well, God gives us the answer here. He says, through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. See, the law of sin and death held us in custody. And you know what that law of sin and death is? It's the law that reminds us of our sin and holds us captive. It comes from our sinful nature. And God tells us in his word that our sinful nature is not weak. It's dead. In the letter to the Ephesians, he tells us 
As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. That leaves us totally incapable of doing anything right in God's sight on our own. It's 100% totally corrupt and evil. That's why God reminds us the mind governed by the, sin, by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. You see the double failure there? It's a total unwillingness, but also it's a total helplessness. That's what we are. That's what the sinful nature has done to us. And God tells us not only what it's done to us, but what it does as far as our relationship with Him. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. In other words, God condemns sin in sinful people. And a few chapters earlier, back in chapter 6, God reminds us exactly how he feels about sin. He says the wages of sin is death. That means that sin produces physical death. Sin produces spiritual death. And the ultimate evil that sin produces is eternal death and eternal separation from God and hell. That's what sin has earned us. And God also tells us that His law, the things that He tells us as far as what sins are, God's law is powerless to help us in this. Now, it doesn't mean there's some kind of flaw or some kind of error in God's word. It's not that the law is weak. See, the problem isn't with the law. The problem is with the people who are attempting to keep God's law the way God wants us to keep it. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> Beginning in 2020, I formed in my mind a detailed exercise plan. And it's all worked out. I joined a gym. I have a diet program all planned out. And it has the discipline that I need. There is absolutely no problem with this plan that I've worked out. The problem was with me and in my ability to carry it out. Same thing is true with our struggle with sin. In the chapter right before our lesson for today, God reminds us what that struggle with sin is all about. And in telling us about that struggle, he uses one of the strongest Christians who have ever lived and uses him as the guinea pig, as the example. The Apostle Paul uses himself. And speaking as a strong Christian, here's what he says. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I have the desire to do what's good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do, no, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Eventually, he throws up his arms and says, what a wretched man I am, who's going to save me from this body of death? He's not speaking as an unbeliever there. He's speaking as a Christian. And friends, we're no different. Our sinful nature gets the better of us every day. Our sinful nature in us is what thinks about trying to cover our tracks. Our sinful nature comes up with all kinds of different solutions to the problems that we face. The, the difficulty with the solutions is that they're all sinful. When work gets frustrating, what does our sinful nature do? Well, I'm going to beat that stress by going out and getting drunk. I'm going to beat that stress by coming home and taking it out on my spouse and kids. I'm going to beat that stress at work by taking it out on my boss and getting it back in some way, shape, or form. Those are all solutions. Sinful nature comes up with all of them. But each and every one of those solutions is a sinful solution. And it doesn't just stop there. It involves every facet of our lives. The doubts and the worries and the frustrations, they all take our focus off the one who takes care of us. 
those and all of our sins, God says, bring condemnation. That's why God tells us those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But friends, where we have failed, God sent Jesus to succeed. He set us free by condemning Jesus instead of condemning us. He put Jesus in our place. He sent his son to be the sin offering, as he reminds us in our lesson. We can't hear that with those words, sin offering, without going back to the Old Testament temple. And that altar of offering, burnt offering, that was out in the courtyard. That's where the animals were slaughtered. That's where the, the bulls and the sheep and the goats and the lambs, the blood was shed and the animals were burnt as a sacrifice. But the blood of every one of those lambs that was poured out was a foreshadowing of the blood of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's the beauty of the opening words in our lesson for today. After the frustration that the Apostle Paul was expressing, who will, this, this, what a wretched man I am, who's going to save me from this body of death? There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God has given us this gift of trust in His one and only Son, Jesus. And by giving us that, the Spirit has set us free. He lives in us. And as He lives in us, He's put Jesus in us as well. And with the Holy Spirit living in us, and Jesus living in us, living in us, God gives us Jesus' perfection, and God sees us as perfect. Listen again to what he says. He says, So he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. God says those righteous requirements are met in us because Jesus has fulfilled them for us. In Jesus Christ, we become God's perfection, the righteousness of God. The salvation that Jesus had won for us frees us from that curse and the power of sin. That's what true freedom is really all about. The Holy Spirit takes what Jesus has accomplished, puts it into your heart through the power of God's Word, and He sets us free. And friends, that's what true freedom is. Freedom that has the power to remove all doubts and all fears and all worries about anything. All because the Holy Spirit has set us free. And Jesus has accomplished it all. But friends, the Holy Spirit hasn't just set our hearts free. He set our lives free. The Lord tells us that changes, this changes our lives as well. That's why he says those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. As believers in Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, this, this joy of the salvation, the forgiveness that we have in Jesus Christ, that inspires us to do what God wants us to do and to want what God wants for us. That freedom is a whole different way of life. That complete change of attitude in our lives. It gives us a whole new way of looking at everything that takes place in our lives. Yes, even being quarantined and, and having to stay home and, and all these disruptions in our lives. The law of the spirit of life has set us free. Jesus' freedom that he has given to us has set us free and eliminated the threat of eternal death has removed the guilt of our sins. Jesus did it by his death and resurrection. And because of him, we can now focus completely on living that peace that he has established for us. Every thought, every word, every action in our lives can be focused on the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. But the only way that can happen is through the Spirit's power. And how's the Spirit going to empower us? He's going to empower us through word and sacrament. He's going to remind us daily of our baptisms, which brought us into God's family, and put God's name and His salvation into our hearts. 
He's going to give us that forgiveness through the announcement of as we had at the beginning of the service. He's going to do it through the reception of His body and blood in, with, and under that bread and wine of the Lord's Supper. He gives us real actions and real change of attitude. You see, that's a real life that the Holy Spirit gives to these bodies of ours. He puts real joy into our hearts that display itself in the generosity that we show the hospitality, the encouragement that we give to one another, even when we can't physically be with one another. The opportunities to, to message each other on, on Facebook, to pick up the phone and call and encourage one another to see how, how we're doing in our land with God family during this time. That's not just the job of the pastor. That's not just the job of the elders. That's an opportunity for all of us to do this. And see, the, the amazing thing is that, that God encourages exactly that kind of attitude and action. He says, the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. God encourages us all of these things, not to draw attention to ourselves, but rather to draw attention to our Savior and service to Him. That's what Jesus was talking about in our Gospel for today, when He had to remind all of His disciples about what true service and greatness was. It wasn't about who got to sit close to Jesus in His glory. It was about one who is willing to serve. Even as the Son of Man did not come to serve, but, but he did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Holy Spirit has set us free for exactly that kind of service to God. Yes, freedom is an incredible thing. I think we're going to treasure our freedom that much more when we can finally get out and go to the grocery store without wondering when it's going to open, go back to school, go back to work, come back to church, gather around God's Word together, join together in our Bible studies again without having to figure out how to do it virtually. But as believers, we already have the best kind of freedom. The Holy Spirit has set us free. Jesus has accomplished all of it so that we can give total service to God. Friends, as long as we are in this world, we will have sin. But by God's grace, sin will not have us. That's why he tells us, if, if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. Dear friends, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ is in you. Yes, the Spirit has set us free, and we are free indeed. God guide us in this freedom that He has given to us, that we may boldly and confidently move forward each day, using all the opportunities that God gives to us in total service to Him as we serve one another. God bless you in your freedom. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We're going to join now in confessing our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed as is found in your order of service. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. During this time of the service is when we usually do our friendship registers and also gather our thank offerings to the Lord. As I mentioned on Wednesday evening, uh, we are working on uh, some online giving opportunities. Uh, if, uh, until we have that, uh, you're invited to either um, put your offering in the meal or uh, you can drop it off here at church. I had actually had a few people who did that already this morning. And uh, we look forward to being able to serve God with you and make those opportunities available.
we bow our heads for prayer. Blessed are you, O Lord, and blessed is your name forever. Blessed are you, O Lord, and blessed is your word forever. Blessed are you, O Lord, and blessed is your Son, Jesus, forever. O God, we praise you for your mercies. You have redeemed our life from destruction and crowned us with loving kindness. You've not dealt with us as our sins deserve, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Out of your unspeakable grace and mercy, you gave your only Son to be made sin for us, that we have eternal life. We bless and praise you that through faith in Christ, we are delivered from bondage of sin into the glorious liberty of your children. Cause your gospel to be preached in all lands and in every language. Maintain your church in the true faith as one body under Christ. Deliver us from the evil of this world and preserve us in all dangers we face. To all who suffer sickness, pain, disease, affliction, or adversity of body, mind, or spirit, give the strength that will enable them to bear their cross. Help us always to pray, your will be done. And Lord God, we come to you today asking for a special measure of your protection and, Lord, your, your power and your, your grace to relieve us from this calamity that has bestowed upon our entire world right now. Lord, there is much fear in the world. There's uh, the fear of the unknown, the fear of what might happen, all these things. But Lord, you are in control. We ask that you would use all the the agencies and avenues that you've given to us to keep us safe during this time. We thank you especially for those who are putting their lives in harm's way, uh, all people who are working in medical fields uh, to, to take care of the people who are sick and to uh, watch over us during this time. We thank you for those who continue to go to work each and every day to make sure that the necessities of our lives are, are there for us. Uh, people who work in the grocery stores, restaurants, our EMTs and police and fire uh, who are still making themselves available. Lord, we thank you for all these precious gifts. Help us, Lord, to appreciate uh, all the things that you've given to us as we gather together in our homes, as we gather around your word. Help us, Lord, to truly appreciate the freedom that you've given to us in Jesus. Here is Lord as we bring you our private petition. of your grace and the gift of your salvation in Jesus Christ. May we always and only boast in you and your great love for us. Father, in the glorious name of your Son and for his kingdom's sake, we pray these things. Amen. And we join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to join now in singing the last five stanzas of Dear Christians, One and All. Oh, 